All right, how do you want to start? Do you want to do a Jake Turi intro? <laughs> Is that like no intro? Yeah, pretty much. Right. Yeah, let's just do that. I mean, people, if they're clicking on this, they know your name or they know my name. So I guess we'll just kind of start with what we were talking about right before we press record. Yeah. Um, so I'll just continue. So I think the within American college athletics, between like 2005 to 2015, the idea around it, whether or not you should do Olympic lifts, the – the, the dominant culture behind it was you have to do the Olympic lifts. You have to learn a full clean, a full snatch, um, a split jerk, a power jerk. You have to learn all this. And if you don't, you're missing key qualities of athleticism that you can't, uh, you really can't get anywhere else. And if you don't do the Olympic lifts, you're not going to develop um, as a holistic uh, athlete, fulfilling your potential. At some point, probably in the later 2010s, 2016, 17, 18, I think there was kind of this push of you don't have to Olympic lift, but now that pendulum has become you shouldn't Olympic lift. And I think the people, the, I think many of the people pushing the idea that you shouldn't Olympic lift because it's a waste of time. Um, and then they want to, they want to look at like force plate data and look at like very negligible I don't want to say meaningless, but not super important metrics on a force plate. They'll look at like eccentric rate of force development on a trap bar jump versus a, a hand clean. We'll get into the participants of those types of studies anyways <laughs> later. Yeah. But they'll try to they'll try to rationalize not using Olympic lifts with with things like force plate data of eccentric rate of force development, <laughs> things like that. Kind of this, yeah. Um, they'll try to rationalize it that way. And I think in their minds, they are like the, they're the scientific ones. They're the ones that are looking at data. They're the evidence-based ones, but they're just missing the, in, in reality, they're missing the holistic outlook on it. So, yeah. No, I couldn't agree more. I think the, the people who say there's, that- there's things, I think there's things, there's value in Olympic lifts that aren't necessarily quantifiable. Correct. that people that people are missing yes yeah exactly well that's just the value in developing different skills i think that's the biggest value and that's a huge there's, that's what i think that's what i was writing about last night was like i just feel like there's a huge disconnect between the ability for your athletes just to acquire different skills in different contexts and this is just one context that they can develop it but then going back to your point before about like the pendulum swinging it just that it's so interesting because it's like the people who are saying that you don't have to Olympic lift or you must Olympic lift are kind of are literally the same people. The, yeah, the, they're exactly. reflections of each other. The, it's like saying nothing matters and everything matters. Well, you, you're the same. That's the same person. So it's, it's so important to see both sides and make sense of the, the gray areas when you're d- developing these programs with people. But yeah, it, it's funny. I'll, let's talk about the metrics because I think the metrics are really interesting. So we know that people fantasize a lot about force place data, whether it's like, do we really need another counter movement jump study? Like, do do I really need to see what that looks like? And right. yeah, it's really interesting about how people can apply that data. And it was something I was speaking to about with Rob Gray. And he was saying how a lot of the baseball teams are investing so much money in development in biomechanics and and so like they've they've got these detailed analysis of the body and what it's doing at different positions to reduce injury but it's kind of like the force plate data i think like we are mounting all this information and there's all these studies but i just don't think it's going to find the answers that coaches are trying to find solutions to i just don't think that that's where they're going to find like where they're going to solve their own problems it's not in the force plate data no not at all that's why uh, in a lot of my like YouTube uh, titles or Instagram posts, I'll, <laughs> I'll call things meaningless and people don't really understand what I'm, it's like, it's not like that I'm saying that the outputs themselves are meaningless, but like the overarching theme behind uh, a lot of the concepts are kind of meaningless. Like they don't, they don't provide, they don't provide value that many think they're going to provide. 
yeah that that's like <laughs> that's literally the whole conversation and i feel like people pretend that they're like oh, don't have you know no dogma approach anti-dogma approach but the reality is is you, you're kind of missing the whole point so i feel like when people start like a very simple a very common comparison at the moment is like say you people just trying to do contrasts or people trying to do olympic lifts with uh, and comparing them to trap bar jumps let's so say for example and the strength coach that is putting the video up is power cleaning 40 kilos and it's like okay well let's have a real low resolution of what's actually happening here that is a, such a low stimulus exercise like a 40 kilo power clean like whenever i see power cleans online from strength coaches it's usually 40 kilos um they've got the illico bar and <laughs> it's just like dude i don't i don't know um what's going on there like if you just understand like one of your principles has to be that you value creating a high level stimulus for your athletes over picking movements that you think are like better or, or more optimal i feel like that's the solution to the optimality um discussion is just picking the greatest level of stimulus yeah so um i, I want to hear your take so there was a jordan newsma who is he's a nice guy <laughs> i've met him before i've talked to him um but he put out he tagged me in an instagram post um comparing I want to say he was comparing like average bar velocity of uh hang clean versus a trap bar jump. And he was using the same loads for both. So here you're doing a trap bar jump with 40 kilos or you're going to do a, a hang clean with 40 kilos. And I just got to, I just got to hear your take on it because in my, like, why are you using the same absolute loads? Like I can jump, I can jump with 40 kilos on a trap bar nothing's going to go wrong. I can jump with full max effort. Nothing's going to go wrong. If I clean 40 kilos with full max effort, I'm going to throw the bar through the ceiling. Like these, these aren't comparable loads. Um, if you want to, if you want to compare the two and look at some sort of metric, you have to use like relative intensities that are comparable to both. So yeah, I want to hear your take on that. Cause I, I sent that to you, right? Yeah. Yeah. It, it's kind of like yeah. the, argument of like making the athletes at the end of the session do tons of sprints and for some athletes it's like that's the you're making them run at like tempo and, and for some athletes like 50 percent of their their best sprint and other athletes they're just dying so it's like having that it although it's like we've controlled the situation by picking the same load it's not at all the same situation it's not at all the same stimulus or the same output and especially ones using a different bar they're both completely different tasks. So the most important part to understand is the all those metrics are task dependent. So when people talk about power, power is the most interesting one because power is task dependent. So work over time, but what's the work you're actually doing? So if you're jumping with a bar that's connected to you and it's a part of you, you're not <laughs> going into the same positions where you're creating propulsion on an external mass and then you have to go straight into triple flexion. So, and then again, you have to control that uh, power output like you just said you you can't use all of your energy into one lift you actually have to do a slower first pull or if it's off the hang you may have to take the slack out if it's off the blocks you have to take the slack out it's a very there's a lot of there will be very different pre-activations happening in the body and then pre-activations as you're receiving and moving under the bar so from just like a pure task you know perspective so understanding the skill first they, they're completely different so they're obviously going to have completely different outputs so then we're trying to measure things like bar velocity at a like you can see maybe from a without looking into it too much maybe it could be comparable but when you start getting below the surface and understanding what's going on behind the scenes those two things are completely different it's like yeah they're, they're not even the same thing but you can so then the fact that those two movements should compete for the same slots in a program is also pretty like flawed. And then we have, and then we have the discussion of like, well, it doesn't really matter. And that comes back to it all the time. It's like, it doesn't really matter which ones they do, but those two, those two movements are completely different. So it's really yeah. difficult to, to make, to make comparisons. And then as intensity increases, I feel like so many people, you know, do, do we really, if it, anyone who walks into the gym can do a trap bar jump. Like any, right. any, any person can walk into the gym and just do, do a trap bar jump straight away. So from a skill perspective, we're not really challenging the athletes to learn anything new or, or overload them in different ways. And that's something that I think um, 
I know I'm jumping around a lot, but I really like how Franz Bosch talks about it and Rob Gray, how they say the overload is like learning new skills is overload and how you're creating new sensory motor packages and how that's going to stimulate you as well. So it's like what we're getting back to earlier about before, I think before we started recording was how a lot of things that we're trying to quantify with the Olympic lifts or when we're trying to make comparisons aren't necessarily quantifiable. And that gives a lot of anxiety to coaches because then they just did this whole degree where they're trying to have the science behind everything they do. And right. then they don't necessarily have the metrics or the abilities to, to measure these things. Yeah. So like the whole like return on investment kind of phrase has been popularized over here. I don't know if it is in Australia, but like, in the long term, like what is going to provide a, a greater return on like obviously the investment is the training, the time, the effort, the time to recover, all those things. That's the investment of your training. The return is what? It's because like the adaptation. Like, what's the adaptation you are eliciting via a trap bar jump versus what's the adaptation you're eliciting via a full learning the full snatch, the full clean, a power jerk, a split jerk, and then all of the variants with all of those exercises too like the ob obviously the olympic lifts are going to produce a much greater return on investment in the long term like again if if you're if you're if you're viewing olympic lifts through, through the lens of producing power and you have a short term mindset yeah in, in 8 weeks maybe the trap bar jump is going to contribute to like a greater a greater improvement in sprint performance or jump performance for an athlete over the course of eight weeks. But what about eight years from now, you know? Um, but and the other then, thing so is, little, the, oh yeah, go on. Yeah, yeah, keep going, yeah, sorry, go ahead. <laughs> I was gonna say, if trap bar jumps make your sprinting better in eight weeks, how shit are you at sprinting? Hey, you're right, exactly. <laughs> like, you're, you're so severely untrained that anything is gonna work. Well, the thing is, if your if your sprints got better, like if your forty yard time dropped by point two or point three, right now, and, and you attribute it to the fact that you did trap bar jumps, yeah, you've got to wonder, like, you must have been running some really bad times. Yeah, it doesn't make any and sense. So I went, I went and did that experiment that Jordan had posted on Instagram just because I wanted, I wanted to see it, I wanted to try it. Um. I think I could jump. I could maybe jump like less than an inch. Like I could jump as high, just as high. So you could like slide a sheet of paper under my feet with 180 kilos on a trap bar, like barely get off the ground. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But I can clean, I can clean 180 kilos on any given day. So like when you really start loading up, you can. I mean, not all the Olympic lifts because I can't snatch that much, but I can clean way more weight than I can jump with. And then if I'm barely jumping with 180 kilos, at that point, it just turns up, it just turns into like a Louis Simmons, Louis Simmons West Side dynamic effort deadlift. And then I don't know, you like I charted this all out. I should have been able to should have brought this up. Yeah. I like charted this, I like made this kind of like low velocity profile just for fun. And like, you can tell I can just load up and move the bar and move the heavier bar cleans way better than a trap bar. And that's, that's always, that's always used as the justification. Um, not always, but oftentimes that's, that's used as the justification for why you should do a trap bar jump or a barbell jump or some other loaded jump is because you're moving this weight at a certain speed and it's produced because power is just a math equation. There's a sweet spot. There's a sweet spot for power. It, yeah, exactly. <laughs> you're just you're just combining the two optimal uh force and velocity to to create a greater power output. But it really isn't even true if you are uh working with an athlete who is I wouldn't say I'm like super proficient at the Olympic lifts. I'm just like competent enough that I can perform it and get a get a good stimulus out of it. So if you're using, if you're using people who suck at Olympic lifting, obviously the bar path is going to totally S curve and then their timing is going to be all messed up. There's going to be so many technical flaws that it's not even worth looking at any sort of data with anyways, you know?
but but okay before we move on so then so then on that so with your with with the work that you do how many of the people that you work with th- this is at north dakota at und how many of them do olympic lifts good question so i just got switched with the team that i work with so i used to work with men's basketball uh women's volleyball tennis and football yeah volleyball athletes i did have them olympic lift tennis i I didn't and men's basketball i didn't now i work with women's golf men's golf women's golf they do olympic lift men's golf they don't i'm still with tennis they don't i work with softball players they currently don't but they will later on once i've been like more comfortable with them so i can get into the reason why not for certain teams yeah yeah which i think Let's do it. So I think it's totally fine to say, it's totally fine to say, I'm not going to Olympic lift these athletes because I just don't think like the time and effort is worth it due to the logistics, the scheduling of their training sessions, the equipment you have, how big the group is. I just don't think it's worth putting in my time to teach them to get good at the Olympic lifts. Totally fine. Not totally fine to say, to try to make a merit merit based uh, argument that the Olympic lifts are bad, not not fine. So, softball. Talk about softball that I work with right now. They lift two days a week. They're on the road four to five days per week. Their lifts are 40, 40 minutes each, and it's like twenty five girls. I just have I've only met them for like four months at this point. Had no idea what I was walking into. Um, and that's really why I just they're only going to lift twice a week for 40 minutes. I just rather get them strong. And they're so untrained anyways. They're 18 to 22 year old girls. If we just front squat, back squat, RDL, pull up, push up, bench press, they're going to get much more athletic for a long time, you know? So that's why I don't with them. Men's basketball. I really wanted to, some of the guys really wanted to, but if you've ever worked with basketball athletes, half the guys just hate lifting. It's like pulling teeth to get them to do anything in there. And I was just like, now I'm not going to spend my time trying to get you to, I'm not going to spend my, trying, my time trying to get you to learn how to hang clean from above the knee. If you're going to not want to do it in the first place, and then your effort's going to be poor. It just wasn't worth it for me. Tennis, kind of the same situation with uh, softball. They lift two days a week for 30 minutes. Um, and half the half the weeks they don't even lift. So like I'll get a text from their coach at three in the afternoon when they're supposed to have a four third lift saying he's canceling the lift. So I just haven't had haven't really had a good time to like implement that stuff. But I'm totally a proponent if you have the time, you have the you have the necessary the necessary resources to include it. Totally a proponent for pretty much everybody to do it. So yeah. So obviously is this something that you've changed your mind on? Or is this something like, say, when you first started working at UND, where you're like, okay, I already know everybody's going to power clean. Everybody's going to, I'm going to teach everybody a clean pool. Is this, is that something that you change your mind over, over the years? Mm, good question. I was super naive when I started coaching. Well, we all so are. I love the, I love the way, obviously. That's why I do what I do. I guess I kind of assumed that everybody else loves the weight room too. And I was a football player where, in football, there's a cult, like a weight room culture in football. So I was around other guys who like lifting. Um, so I, I actually did back in 2018, 2019, I tried to implement the Olympic list with tennis, but again, it's like, I got a 19 year old girl who weighs 125 pounds who could barely even like get the bar into a front rack, just a, an empty, empty bar, 20 kilos. And it's just like, no, so I think yeah, I I've changed my mind now. I now, now I assume that athletes don't want to lift, as be- whereas before I assumed they did want to lift, and that totally changes the way I approach training for college athletes. Yeah, that that that's awesome to to see that change as well. Like yeah, I feel like you have to go through that. So then a lot of the stuff that I see online, like particularly Twitter, I've only been on Twitter for a few, maybe a month. And I'm still unsure what I think of it, but the, uh, the, the, the general consensus is from a lot of popular coaches is 
you can never be strong enough. Like you can never be strong enough. But then as someone like for yourself and then using the arguments, using the argument of, well, Olympic lifts don't make you strong. And, you know, that it's kind of like a clickbaity. It's kind of like they're baiting and fishing for something there because obviously strength is an expression of skill. So you can express strength through various skills. It's a lot easier to ex- express your strength on a chair sitting down doing leg press than it is through a snatch, but the, uh, <laughs> through, a, through a more difficult coordination pattern. But then where do you see that you can't be strong enough, like emerge in some of like the things that you do? Or like, is it just particularly like football? Is that like that culture where, you know, you, you just need to be strong enough or is that just like a meat old meathead mindset? I don't really understand the question. Yeah. You know how people talk about like, you can never be strong enough or strength's never a weakness. Mm-hmm. That, what do you think yeah, that? that slogan. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, what do you I think mean, about that? I don't know. So I would agree in the sense that like once you've you've hit like a requisite uh, level of strength in certain contexts, you don't need to continue to pursuing greater strength expression in that context. But I would say I would never say don't train for maximal strength anymore. Just find other ways to provide a maximal strength stimulus in other contexts. So like if you can squat 600, if you can back squat 600, but your front squat, you haven't front squatted very much. So you can't express strength in a front squat, start front squatting and you still get the the stimulus um, that you need to improve strength, but you're just, you're broadening the context in which you can express that strength. Does that make sense? hundred percent. Would, yeah. would you agree with that? <laughs> I would agree so much. Yeah. It's, but it's That's it's, just, like, just keep varying, just keep varying different exercises and find ways to like get better, get stronger. Yeah. And that's something that I think is awesome about the Olympic lifts, like doing the split catches, complexes. Um, you know, if, if someone just wants to, for, for a lot of the athletes, the very like variability for for some, unless they're like really, really weak, but for a lot of them, like the variability side of things is just going to add a bit more novelty in their training as well, if they're just playing their sport so much. But uh, yeah, I think, I think that's such an interesting, it's such an interesting thing how coaches will just view it as like, you must learn the back squat. I was like, no, you must learn how to squat. And there's so many ways you can do that. The variability thing with the Olympic lifts is hugely underrated, I think. Um, like, if you know how to full clean, you know how to full snatch, you know how to split jerk, power jerk, um, you know how to do it, do it all from the hang, you can do it from the blocks, you can do different complexes, you can do pulls, low pulls, high pulls, jump shrugs, you can do all of the different variants and I guess drill work maybe for all the Olympic lifts. Think about, you're never going to run out of like, uh, you're never going to run out of training stimuli because you can always add variety to your training if you know how to do all of those. There's so many combinations that you can uh, put together. Whereas if oh, going back to the loaded jumps comparison, I mean, how many different ways can you load a jump? Just you just can't. I mean, if you're really creative, you can. I I can figure out a lot of different ways to load a jump, but still, you're doing you're jumping. Jumping itself is going to um, you're going to run into some law accommodation at some point if you're only jumping. But if you, here's the other thing too. If you're not doing Olympic lifts, you can never just throw them in if you're not proficient in them, if you're not confident in them. But if you can do them, you can always take a break from the Olympic lifts and do other means of training for a while and throw Olympic, li- Olympic lifts back into your training later on. You know, I think the, the whole variability thing with Olympic lifts is hugely, hugely underrated. Yeah, that that's I think that's where the, the a benefit of well, where one of the larger benefits lie. It's um yeah, just understanding how to create a different stimulus. It just comes back to that one principle. If, do you know how to create a stimulus? Do you know like what is the intent behind your sessions? So I think maybe that's where a lot of people also go wrong when they're trying to define they they don't have a clear and I know this is is true and and probably people like people might disagree but I know for a fact people do not have well thought out intents behind what they do. If you were to question them on the things that they do or the training that they currently have, it would literally fall apart. They would really struggle to find answers and reasons behind why they pick certain things. And it's not sometimes it's just like 
it doesn't matter. Like sometimes it's just like, well, we're going to squat. We want them to get stronger legs. And I love the video that you've done on uh, variations. And I couldn't agree more. It said so well. It's like, they'll do a similar thing. So, like, the squat variation, like the, what's the difference between a front squat and a back squat? It's like, it's a squat. It's you very, get stronger legs. It's a, but you <laughs> get stronger legs. <laughs> that's all that happens. And I think for a lot of people, that's like, Oh, such high IQ, but uh, yeah, it's crazy. So then, yeah, trying to trying to divide the time up in the training week. How are you if if you're deciding on Olympic lifts or not? Just purely due to resources, is that you have clear intents behind the sessions that you're trying to design for your athletes, or are you just like currently, you know, we're just going to do a little bit of everything each day. We're going to do we're going to do movement preparation. We're going to do some kind of lower body strength and you you kind of have it in the you you mentioned before you have like those basic movement patterns you want to tick off each session is that kind of how you design the sessions or i know for your own training and for the hoss concurrent maybe let's talk about the hoss concurrent because i think that's really interesting and how you go about designing those sessions and whether or not to include olympic lifts in that training week yeah okay so hoss concurrent um so we olympic lift three days per week I really don't know how I decided on that frequency. I think I originally had it in there for two days a week um, because I marketed it on Train Heroic as like advanced or intermediate athletes. Um, so like assuming if someone's an intermediate or an advanced like trainee, I guess you should assume that they at least know how to do most of the Olympic lifts. So I, I decided two days a week and then like within the messaging, uh, part of the app I just asked if they wanted more and a lot of people said, said they like Olympic lifting so we'll do more um, so we do three days a week um, but yeah it's we're gonna hit snatch every week we're gonna hit a clean every week I honestly I honestly hate doing jerks because I suck at them so I don't put that in as much <laughs> so we'll either snatch twice clean once or clean twice snatch once and then maybe um, maybe if we're cleaning I'll throw a jerk in there too so it'll be like a clean and jerk type of complex something like that I want to do something to get my leg, my legs strong twice a week, something to get my upper body strong twice a week. Um, I want to hit the Olympic lifts two to three times a week, uh, just because I think they are, like we stated earlier, they are such a unique uh, set of exercises that provide such a unique stimulus that really can't be replicated at doing anything else. So I want to hit that two to three times per week. Uh, and then I want to do something for like my aerobic system a couple times per week. And I want to do something that's, I'll, I'll call it athletic a couple times a week, sprint, jump. Um, and that's the way I structure it. And then really I kind of pick the exercises randomly. Um, there'll be like two to three to four week uh, waves where we do the same exercise, but with a slight variation. So it could be a front squat one week, a front squat from the pins week two, a front squat to a box week three, and then back to a regular front squat week four, something like that. Um, and then with the Olympic lifts, it's just it's be a lot of complexes because we're not training to go to the Olympics. I'm not training for like a one rep max, uh, clean and jerk and snatch. So we're just going to get good at all the variants of the movements, hang clean, pull clean, clean from blocks, uh, tempo cleans, pause cleans, whatever it is. Um, so I kind of, that's kind of randomized the, like the specific exercises, the specific variants that we do. Um, but I want to hit those a couple times a week, two to three times a week. That's really it. So then do you have like land, any landmine cleaning jerks in the program? None. I hate those things. Do you ever use those? <laughs> no. What about you see, the, you see the videos of them, people doing them? <laughs> this one where they like turn it? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. What? Like there was a guy. That I don't want to say it. I don't want to say that stuff's bad because all training is better than no training, you know? Yeah, but um, that's not but a, I, that's not a good argument. <laughs> but I think, like, again, they're trying to replicate the Olympic lifts without actually having to do them. That's really what I think they're doing. Just do the Olympic lifts. Yeah, at that and point. It, just... it, it's actually way harder to do an Olympic or, to, yeah, to do a landmine clean and jerk. Than a just a regular clean and jerk. Have you tried to do the Olymp the Olympic lifts on a landmine? It's so clunky. The bar like slides in and out of the sleeve. Uh, just the way that it's it's uh, that it's in that uh, 
that axis it like rotates differently every single time that the, the uh how you're able to like time up your feet coming down to the floor and catching the bar in like the landmine front rack position. <laughs> it's all, it's all screwed up. Um, there's no cons rep to rep consistency for anybody doing it. It's way harder than a normal, than a normal Olympic. League. So then something that I find like really interesting, obviously like everyone's trying to like yeah, get the edge and whether that's just looking, you know, whether that's that, training makes up 10% of their program, which it probably does, or maybe even less. The um, What do you think about those? I don't know what they're called, but the ones where you can do like a, a sprint start with the weight and kind of press the weight out of the rack. Have you seen those before? The jammers? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think it's like, again, it's, it's fine to do, but I'm probably never going to find enough value in that that I'm going to make that a priority in training you know that's my view of it yeah 100 percent. so well, then a lot of it is a lot of it is you'll be standing in a staggered stance and a lot of it will be leg drive into a press into a step you know and it's like which which one are you which one are you doing are you working on like leg drive, or are you working on pressing with your arms, or are you working on like stepping through the finish? You know, you're trying to combine all of these three things. The coordination pattern gets gets all screwed up because you don't really know you don't really know what the intent is. Like, what's a good rep? What if you have really strong leg drive, but you can't time it up with the press, and then you can't time it up with the step? You know, like I don't really know what you're accomplishing. Yeah, it's it's. it's I couldn't I couldn't judge what a good rep is. I couldn't say that's a good rep, that's a bad rep because it's going to look different for so many different people. Rep to rep. So then, going back to the load selection for Olympic lifts. So now we've said we we kind of addressed a few things. We addressed a few myths. But when it comes to now, all right. Well, how much how much does someone have to lift, or how proficient does someone have to be in the Olympic lifts for then it to be a viable? option for us to say okay i know what adaptation you're getting from it now like i can see i can i obviously can define that as a good quality rep like i was i was watching some videos of Werner gunther do some weightlifting the other day and his power cleans weren't you know i'm i'm a snob obviously olympic lifting is what I, like that's the main thing i i do that's what i want to be known for and they're the main kind of athletes i work with but they weren't like the prettiest power cleans I've ever seen. They were pretty much just like a turnover. He did 180, kind of just muscled it up. He didn't really catch it that deep. His elbows are pretty low, but I could see that he's getting a pretty fast. He's going from he's going from triple extension to triple flexion. He's getting a follow through. He's producing a lot of lower body force. There's 180 kilos flying up through the air. It has to be done from his lower body to some extent. So, like, is there a a lot of people will, will say that maybe Olympic lifts, you know, it's hard to find the proper dose or it's hard to find the proper, um, you know, hard to find a level of stimulus, but I just don't believe that there's a magic load or a, there's a magic weight where you can get benefits from doing them, assuming that you're not having to fight for resources in time or the program. You know, I just don't think like them by themselves, there's, there's a, there's not a magic load. No, I would agree with that. And as far as like, how proficient someone has to be in order for it to be like a useful training method. I don't really know. A lot of that's probably going to be subjective to the coach's eye, but like if you can hit certain landmarks within the movement pattern, you're probably good. Like as long as let's just talk about the first pull, for example, if your ass isn't coming up right away or transitioning from the first pull, pull to the second pull, if you're able to like, maintain your back angle to a certain degree before getting vertical so you don't have the bar hit your knees like the bar can you're patient enough let the bar cross your knees before you bring your hips forward and get more vertical things like that um if it's really clunky yeah it's probably not super productive at that time but then that's why you take the time to get better at it at the movement pattern and then three weeks, three months, who, who knows how long it takes for something to get better at it. But down the road is probably going to be a pretty effective stimulus and training method for most people to use. So, yeah. 100%.
Yeah. And that, and that's a big part of it. Just understand, like coming back to that, when we're trying to divide up our training or trying to, trying to allocate slots to training, just what kind of thing are we trying to drive? What adaptation are we trying to drive rather than we're trying to drive this metric and, and that's where things get really weird. Yeah. Yeah, I don't really have much to add after that. No, nah, that's pretty good. Yeah, it, it's kind of just like Do the, you wanna the, hey, do you wanna do you wanna go through some of these takes? Yeah, dude, let's do it. Let's do I feel it. like let's we cover I feel like we covered a lot of stuff. Yeah, and I feel like I'm talking like a retard too. Fuck. Um <laughs> no, you're not. You're doing good. I'm gonna I'll I'm edit look, it up. I'm looking through your notes here. All right, tell me. All right. Weightlifting needs to oh okay, here we go. Weightlifting needs to be fast to make explosive power. I'm here to take on that. What's explo- what is explosive power? Good question. <laughs> what is explosive power? <laughs> well, it's so task dependent. So um yeah, I just <laughs> it's really hard for it's load dependent too. Yeah, well that's the it's thing. Load dependent too. Like, yeah, if obviously if you have more load, the velocity is going to drop and that's going to, the whole, the whole context of the, uh, the task changes. So something that I've always, weightlifting needs to be fast to make explosive power. That does, that doesn't mean anything. Well, so this is the really interesting thing in order for you to be successful at any weightlifting attempt, they're usually fast. So bar it's speed, gotta, it's gotta be, yeah, it's gotta be fast enough. Regardless of the load, the regardless of the yeah. load. So the really interesting thing, and this is what Mlad- Mladen talks about in agile periodization, when he talks about VBT, velocity-based training, when he talks about that, he says, well, it just doesn't really solve as many problems for a lot of people because bar speed is so constant in weightlifting. There's a bandwidth of velocity that you need. It, and it's, it's fairly narrow. As load increases, it, the people are more thinking the the bar won't continue to float up as high or for as long. Obviously, it's heavier. It's gonna want to. It's gonna want to start to fall quicker. But the velocity that you can produce in that second pull, I would argue, if we plotted a lot of your lifts from forty kilos to one eighty, it would be very consistent. Because you're having to modulate that force and probably right. towards that 140 to 180, the bar velocity or the peak velocity is actually not dropping off as much as people think. Yeah. Well, I've made this point before that what's so great about the Olympic lifts is that you have to produce high forces. You have to produce high power outputs, but you have to be precise about it too. Like you can't just rip on the bar as hard as you can without any any regard for precision and accuracy, it's not going to be a successful rep. And I think that's hugely underrated in the Olympic list. I don't know. Would you, here's a question for you, actually. Would you say that the Olympic list, we'll just say clean, inherently includes a decelerative component to it? Would you say, well, yeah, would you say that's true, that the clean inherently includes a decelerative component to it? I've never thought of decelerating in the clean. I feel like the bar drops because gravity is going to pull it down when I get under the bar, but I've never thought of like actively decelerating it. If anything, I'm thinking yeah. of um, it's purely totally acceleration agree. movement. If we look at things like acceleration levers and the way the body's organized during an Olympic lift, the shins are forward. It's the, the whole body's in extension. Everything we're trying to do is to create acceleration then we have to go back into triple flexion fast. So we've got that fast eccentric there, which everyone's like getting really excited about lately. I feel like they just found out what a fast eccentric is. And if you mean like, if there's a decelerative part of it, well, you rebound the bottom, you've got that yielding type movement where you use the stretch reflex and you, you get into that deep squat, create a lot of pressure. The, the, the decelerative bar might just be standing up and getting crumbled by a heavy clean. The um the, the actual pull is it's very dynamic. Yeah, so I've heard the take that you are actively decelerating after your pull to get back underneath the bar, which isn't true. 
no no you're not. yeah you're you're accelerating the bar but then you're accelerating yourself back down you're not thinking about it's it it's not an inherent deceleration you know i mean you just described it better than i i ever could but the whole like why would i use a movement that inherently includes a deceleration component to it well that's like a that's like a false premise you're not yeah it's kind of it's kind of interesting take i I never thought of it like that i would probably wouldn't i probably never would say that yeah and even even just like watching weightlifting i feel like there's a also a huge disconnect in weightlifting and and sports performance where they'll make the decision they'll make the argument like that's weightlifting this is performance it's like no they're exactly the same thing i've never seen I would never coach someone differently or explain the movement differently to someone who is a weightlifter and who is an NFL player. It's kind of like that NFL specific clean and then weightlifting clean. Thanks guys for listening. Hopefully you can take some cool takes from this, from Will and I. If you guys have any other questions, feel free to reach out to us on Instagram, Will the Hoss, and I'll see you guys soon. See you. Take care guys.